What's up everyone, and welcome back to another reaction video. Today we are reacting to Pieces of Gaster Volume 1. This was suggested by Reaper Reaper. This is was done by two thumbs. I I'm two left thumbs. Yep, yeah, two left thumbs. <laughs> Sorry I said the name wrong or weirdly. Anyway. This was suggested by Reaper Reaper. And this is all Gaster Theory's evidence explained within both Deltarune and Undertale. So I think this might be the first two chapters, but I could be wrong. And this could only be chapter one of Deltarune. So I don't know what specifically we're going to be talking about. I think more of Gaster's presence than anything else. It's going to be more discussed here than anything else. Or how he's involved in certain activities. I think that's more uh, clear within Room, But in Undertale, I think his activity and involvement is questionable. I mean, besides the followers and his appearance within a certain fun, co fun uh, code, I don't see how there's going to be a whole lot of gaster stuff in Undertale. Unless it is there, but no one really recognized it or something like that. So, yeah. Anyway, with that said, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button. Hit the notification button to be notified immediately when a new video comes out. And leave your recommendations to what I should react to next down in the comment check comment section down below with all this said let's start with this video shall we how's it going guys my name is graham and welcome to two left thumbs this is actually a video i made nearly two years ago it was originally uploaded on the let's play channel because this one didn't exist i recently decided to start moving a bunch of those videos over here so they all exist in one location i really wish i could transfer it with all the views and comments and everything over here unfortunately youtube just doesn't allow that i'll leave that video unlisted on the other channels so we're not losing that legacy content I have made some slight corrections throughout the video and expanded on a few things that have developed in the two years since. It was also a fun opportunity for me to correct a few visual things, as well as making it so you can actually hear the background music. I already did four videos covering two hours worth of content on this game, and yet there's still more to talk about. But those videos were way more about digging up cool secrets and easter eggs within the game. One thing I very intentionally steered clear of throughout those videos was theories. I've been stockpiling a list of cool fan theories or events in the game that tie to these larger ideas, but I haven't made a video digging into anything beyond the surface level yet. Here, I want to do a thorough compendium of everything related to the elusive Dr. Gaster, as well as some very deeply laid seeds that intertwine the worlds of Undertale and Deltarune. And I'll probably sprinkle in a few other relevant things as they come up. Really, Gaster isn't prevalent in Deltarune in any way. Everything that we have to go off of is based off of findings from Undertale. I know you would have heard that is sadly true. With mentions of the fun value, with mentions of theories and all that other stuff relating to Caster. Especially with certain musics or tones or the way it sounds like he's talking. There's not a whole lot to say about him. We know that he was the uh, previous royal scientist, but other than that, it goes off of a course. We know he made the core and all that, but still. 
the Gaster Blaster is obviously his creation. I mean, it has his name and everything. But, uh... Hmm. There's not a lot of stuff to actually say about Gaster. It, it's crazy, I know. I've heard a lot of it before, but people have been digging stuff up for years. There's probably a few things in here you haven't heard. And we can weave things around and lace it all together and link it up to Delta Room. We'd start with a little bit of Gaster's known history. W.D. Gaster was the royal scientist before Alphys, responsible for creating the core. As far as we can tell, Gaster is not present in Undertale whatsoever, but through his followers, these creepy monochrome weirdos that hang out around the world, we learn that something went wrong with one of his experiments, and now his whereabouts and location are unknown. There is a hidden value with Within each save of Undertale that is a fun value. You can't control it or affect it without editing game files, but it allows for certain random events when playing, like finding secret rooms. One of these rooms contains this creepy figure that the game files refer to as Mystery Man. He's a stationary figure with a skull-like face and no proper hitbox, you can walk straight through him. When you interact with Mystery Man, he becomes surprised and flees. One more weird thing about this character is that if you invert it, it still appears to have a proper face. Interestingly, there's events associated with all of the fun values between 61 and 66, with the exception of 64. The fun value in the background required to find this room is 66. 6 is an important value across all of this, it heavily ties to Gaster repeatedly, right down to Gaster's own name being 6 characters long. Now while Gaster doesn't actually appear anywhere in the game, he does have unused stats with an attack and defense of 666666. Something of much more general interest, while numbers like 1 and 8 can be inverted and still look the same, 6 is the only number that can be flipped over and become a new number, similar to the way this mystery man can be flipped around and become a new version. Some important notes about Mystery Man. He is monochromatic, the same as Gaster's followers. His face has cracks on it, linking to the idea of Gaster being shattered across dimensions as described by one of his followers. His face is very skeleton-like, connecting a larger theory that Gaster created Sans and Papyrus. I have more evidence to present to tie all this together, but Yeah, there's... Theories, predictions, I... I still believe, no matter what, that Gaster had some uh, involvement in Sans and Papyrus being, well, born. Because out of everything and everyone in Undertale, Gaster is technically the only skeleton monster, and the time of his disappearance would definitely equal to Sans and Papyrus being born before, a little before that happened. Because if ages act together and all that, then in technicality, they should be around the time Kara fell to the underground. Moving forward, for all intents and purposes, we are going to treat this mystery man as Gaster. Some people disagree with that, some people have competing theories, but when I look at all the available evidence, this makes the most sense to me. If you disagree with that, I would love to hear how and why, because it's super cool to talk about. In a different secret area, someone points out that someone with a creepy smile is spotted behind you, but when you whip around to try and interact with them, there's nothing there. One last related room connected with these fun values is a room containing a transparent figure that is slowly revealed as you approach. Attempting to interact with this figure gives you a displayed set of Wingdings font characters, which when translated, only read Redacted. Upon leaving this room, you are taken to a secret sound test room where you can listen to sounds not used elsewhere in the game. One of the files present is Gaster's theme. Upon selecting this file, you can no longer select any of the others. There is a specific sound effect, the Gaster Fade sound effect. 
That only plays in three instances in all of Undertale, one of which was added after the game's initial release. I'll come back to that one. The first is when Mystery Man disappears when interacting with him, ergo, Mystery Go. The other one is when the head-holding Gaster follower disappears when talking to them. And eventually, after their addition, Clam Girl or Goner Clam uses the Gaster Fade, which directly connects with the Mystery Man and the Gaster followers. Maybe it's a generic sound effect that randomly disappearing black and white characters use, but it seems a little too coincidental. Plus, that Gaster follower literally states that he's holding a piece of Gaster. I couldn't find anywhere that officially refers to it as the Gaster Fade sound effect. I'm pretty sure in game it is Sound Mystery Go. But when it's reversed, slowed down, and looped, it has become the Gaster theme. So oh. yeah, sure, why not call it the Gaster Fade? Oh, wow. That was... <sighs> Heck, got disturbing right there. You mean the Gaster fades or theme? It, it's his theme, but reverse, slow down to like a ridiculous amount. And just, that's it? Holy cow! Interestingly, Clam Girl is the only one we see become a follower. In every other instance, we see versions of these characters before they've turned. This one instance stands out because she changes right in front of us and then disappears. We now have a few isolated connections to draw here. That weird figure in the room by himself who speaks in wingdings is now connected to the sound test room that has the Gaster theme. The Gaster theme is now intertwined with the Gaster Fade, which directly associates with Mystery Man and one of the Gaster followers. Our web here is getting a little more complex. WD Gaster's full name is likely Wing Din Gaster, which kind of altogether becomes a combination of Wing Ding and Aster, two different fonts. There's already examples of Sans and Papyrus being named after the fonts that they use. WD Gaster could literally be Wing Ding's Aster. There are also a few rooms that have nothing to do with the fun value and instead can only be accessed by directly editing in-game files. One of these is room 264, also in-game known as room underscore gaster. It is a black screen typing out shaky wingdings text with the terrifyingly creepy sound file now strongly associated with gaster titled muse underscore smile. The text in this room is now known as entry 17. That would be a very hefty tangent right now, so I'll be sure to give it its own attention later on in the video. Toby not being one to make use of something only once, stretching it to its full potential, this sound can actually be manipulated to recreate Muffet's laugh. I couldn't get it exactly, but the gist of it is that you have to speed it up a few times. And the way the sound is constructed is playing that laugh on its own, then reversed, then on its own, then reversed. So you need to isolate and flip those separate sections, raise the pitch some, and it takes some tinkering, but once you get the speed and pitch roughly right, then you can compare it to the actual Muffet's laugh. And while not perfect, you can tell that they are the same sound. In the time since first making this video, I've lost some confidence in this. And instead, it might just be a neat insight into approximately how this sound was created, if not precisely. That comparison just isn't as exact as it first seemed. Okay, I can get what he's saying about trying to understand where this laugh came from. But... I, um think that necessarily needs to go this much into depth, but it's interesting to hear that um, Muffet's uh, laugh was anyway, yeah. I, uh, I can understand why he's doing this, and I can see the similarities and all that. So, not really a uh, big surprise.
but still a surprise nonetheless that Muppet's laugh was inspiration for, well, Gaster, so, hmm, maybe there are other stuff that were inspiration for other things in this, in these games. Precisely. Yeah. That comparison just isn't as exact as it first seemed. During the Muffet battle, she actually has dialogue tying back to this whole smile thing. The person who warned us about you offered us a lot of money for your soul. They had such a sweet smile, and it's strange, but I swore I saw them in the shadows changing shape. Many have speculated it was Metaton who hired Muffet, and it does make a lot of sense. After all, they have lots of money, have hired others to hunt Frisk, and do literally change shape. After all, they're only premiering their new body later on. That doesn't mean it's the first time they've ever taken that shape. But I think all of this might still be a bit of a red herring. Creeping around in the shadows doesn't really fit their loud personality and typical MO. It's also going to be pretty difficult for mm, one of the true. biggest TV personalities in this world to be discreet. Sure, later on, Metaton takes credit for hiring everyone, but they weren't actively trying to kill Frisk until after they entered the core. With this Muffet encounter taking place so much earlier, there's a good chance that whoever was creeping around in the shadows was someone else. We could either think of this character as transforming, going from mystery man to whatever the hell this is to the thing that this guy's holding, or we go off this idea that he's scattered across time and space, meaning that any, all, or none of these could be Gaster. So more smiling, a weird shadowy figure, the ability to transform, we have two sprites that might actually be Gaster, so maybe he's actually able to transform, assuming that we have this continued connection of smiling. Even crazy thing you can do with the smile sound file, which is just fun to say, there is actually something known as steganography. It's the practice of hiding files, messages, images, and videos and such in other instances of those media types. Now while it sounds like just a bunch of random scattered nonsense, we can open up the spectrogram and see if those frequencies were actually used to draw anything. Speedy on YouTube stretched this out, rotated it, played around with the brightness and contrast, and we seem to have this weird skeletal figure. But more than likely, this was intentionally drawn out within the sound file. Something else that I found in the time since first making this video is this direct quote from Toby. There are some people who are trying to find every secret in the game, so they put stuff into spectrograms and say, look at this guys, it looks like a smiley face, there's a message here. Literally every file you put in there is going to have a smiley face in it if it's just static noise. Some of them still believe it, like, whoa, that says I've made something that makes people willing to believe I would do that, so I feel like that's credit to me. Undercutting the point I just made, it feels like a huge buzzkill, and maybe Toby did do some of that intentionally, I hate to take that away from people, but I feel in the interest of making this video as comprehensive as possible and as accurate as possible, I needed to- It's actually kind of strange how... Some of these soundboards can actually have figure-like shapes and face like shapes I mean does that make sense? I think it makes sense it's just a bit weird. The fun sleuthing underminers have done, as well as a direct response to it from Toby themselves. Across all of this, we now have the following pieces of evidence. The mystery man sprite with a cracked skeleton face and black and white coloring matching Gaster's followers. Two specific references to smiling, with the creepy smiling person that is pointed out but not seen, and the smile sound file. This new smile can be altered to become Muffet's laugh. Muffet talks about a shadowy figure and a man with a sweet smile. As if mystery man's smile wasn't creepy enough, it is equally creepy when flipped upside down. This smile sound file plays in the Gaster room. This room uses Wingding's fonts. The other use of Wingding's fonts is with this hidden figure and tied to Gaster's theme. That theme then connects back directly to the Gaster fade, which Mystery Man and the Gaster followers use. I originally was going to draw lines between all of this, but in the process of attempting to do so, I was literally losing my mind trying to keep track of it all. At the end of it, I was no closer to finding out who Pepe Silva was. So instead, here's just a bunch of things on the screen. I would say this on its own provides very compelling evidence that Mystery Man is Gaster. There's even more to talk about about, but I'm saving it for later parts of the video, so I think this on its own is already plenty of evidence tying all of this together. I should stress here and now that Toby has never confirmed any of this. He, he likes to just spectate, take a step back, and watch people run wild with their detective work. There is an official set of Undertale- I actually kind of like that picture, the one with the pirates being a, tec a detective and all that. And there's tarot cards! I didn't really expect that. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey, whatever is the... Tarot cards. This got really Case. exciting because one of them featured Mystery Man as Gaster. But my understanding of this is that it's something that Dog Bomber did and it was later adapted into being official Undertale merch. And at the time that was done, a few minor changes were made, including Toby telling him specifically to get rid of the Gaster one. So briefly, it seemed like we were getting the closest thing to confirmation we were ever going to have, and it was taken away, leaving us all to speculate like absolute lunatics. When going back and forth with the river person, they have a few random clips of dialogue to share, one of them warning you, beware the man who speaks in hands. Pretty cryptic overall, but we can start to infer that maybe he's referring to wingdings. There's nothing directly linking this to the larger theories of Gaster, Gaster's just a seemingly powerful being, and this is the most literal interpretation of talking in hands that we have. Even though it's not confirmed, it all seems to make sense. Well, I mean, it makes enough sense. Essentially, none of this is present in the regular game. It all required thorough sleuthing, snooping, and rifling around in game files to find this stuff. It leaves a mountain of unanswered questions upon the release of Undertale, as well as a thriving obsession to learn more about the history of WD and what it all means. So now the community has been left with this lavish thirst that never quite fizzled up and obviously came to a tea with the lead up to the release of Delta Room. Toby knew exactly what he was doing and fed off of that with the pre-release of this game brilliantly. Now, you can download and play the first chapter of this game for free on Deltarune.com. This was made public on Halloween 2018, October 31st, but the website had actually existed well before then. The Wayback Machine shows archived- Wait, wait, really? A Deltarune website was made before Deltarune even came out. I honestly gotta give credit to Toby. He's good at what he does. I didn't even know the Delta Room website existed versions of websites over the years. It doesn't automatically catalog these, people have to preserve it themselves. So since this website wasn't public knowledge, it's very likely that Toby preserved these old images of it as breadcrumbs for us. The oldest available goes back to July 2017 and contains a single black image titled him.png. Now while Deltarune the website was not archived further back than that, this image specifically was. You can go all the way back to December 2015, just a few short months after Undertale's release. This oldest version of it contains Wingding text which as we showed is mainly associated with Gaster, which reads in all capitals, this next experiment seems very very interesting. A full year later in December 2016, a much harder to read message was deciphered as reading, three heroes appeared to banish the angels heaven. The three heroes don't really have a place in Undertale, but are very very important to Delta Room. But... Clever. Does that mean that Gaster has been observing Delta Room for longer than predicted. How did he even find them? Wait, he scattered around time, throughout time and space. So it makes sense a part of him would actually know. Alright, I'll give him. Gonna... I guess I have an answer, I the guess. The Angel's Heaven is rather interesting. There's a prophecy in Undertale that reads, The Angel, the one who has seen the surface, they will return, and the underground will go empty. It's interesting how this works either way. You either allow the monsters to return to the surface or wipe them all out, either way leaving the underground empty. Maybe suggesting that the three heroes of Deltarune will set a new course preventing these events, or it could be that the Angel's Heaven has already been banished. It's uncertain exactly where this game takes place in the timeline. It also depends how we interpret this heaven. Is that the version where everyone lives above or where they all die below? Really, it kind of raises more questions than it answers, but it shows some really early connections between Undertale, Deltarune, and Gaster. There are even some older tweets from Toby around that time dating back to the end of December 2015, so this would have been closer to the time of the first version of him.png. The success of Undertale has been incredible, thank you to the artists, the fans, and my friends for supporting me in 2015, but lately something has left me feeling unsettled, a burning, inexplicable feeling. You could say, its very nature is shrouded in dark. For a lot of people, you might start worrying about their own personal well-being and that they might be losing their grip on reality. But here, what might have caught your eye is that Toby is clearly quoting something. And interestingly, he is quoting himself from all the way back in 2013 on a Kickstarter update for Undertale, claiming that immediately after that game was finished, he would begin scripting out his next game. The other game, I can't tell you anything about it. Its very nature is shrouded in darkness. 
So now all of a sudden we have things dated back to 2013. Toby clearly knew he was making another game, he knew it was related to Undertale, and he knew that the Dark World was going to play a part. The original designs of Lancer, Rudin, Clover, Hathi, the King, and Jebel all come from a 2012 art project by Kano Times, who Toby credits as being a big source of inspiration for him. These creative designs were something that immediately sparked something in Toby's mind. He started building and fleshing out a world, not knowing exactly what he was going to do with it. On November 1st, 2018, after the release of Deltarune, after that 24-hour grace period, Toby released this screenshot from an old script at the beginning of May 2012, with work-in-progress dialogue for Lancer. So Toby already had these designs to go off of, he had already come up with a name, he had come up with some semblance of a story, there was a lot going on. Even though we hadn't heard of it until its release, Deltarune was in development way back then. An entire... That is amazing to hear that... A sequel to a game that you already had ideally figured out was already being developed as the first game was being made. That's crazy. In a cool way, that is. Three years before Undertale's release, and six full years before Deltarune was released, plans for this game were already underway. Now at length, Toby has talked about Deltarune being something different, some sort of alternate universe, but it seems unlikely that it's an alternate universe the way that Marvel Comics does their what-if storylines. This isn't some silly playing around in the sandbox just to see what happens. These two games are intertwined to a degree that is very complex and wholly unique. Now I understand none of this itself is a theory, but it is important for setting the stage when talking about this under-ruined Delta Tail universe that we have going on. These characters, events, details, and stories are inexorably linked. I know that's a lot of time spent talking about the lead up to the release of the game, now we can start layering in that factual timeline with more actual theory. Here I want to look at Toby and Undertale's Twitter accounts leading up to release. Things got kind of buck wild over there the day before, October 30th, making everyone's heads explode in anticipation. Toby kicked things off with a tweet that's about as cryptic as it comes. It's cold. It's as if everything has been enveloped in a black wind. We don't realize it yet, but it seems that there's someone who wants to talk to you. The black wind itself is very notable. It's the sound effect that was used at the end of Undertale's genocide run. As a side note, the black wind is also a recurring motif in Chroma Trigger. It's often seen as a magical force connected with the presence of the primary antagonist, Lavos. Coldness being enveloped in black wind, it all harkens back to Shrouded in Darkness. There's interesting ways to look at this. Is there a character within the game who wants to talk to us personally? Is a character wanting to talk to another character in the game? It's very mysterious and is something that's still not totally clear at this point. Next, I hopped over to Undertale's Twitter account where we're introduced to this someone who seemingly wants to talk to us. Welcome. You've been looking for me? How wonderful. I have been looking for you as well. I have something. Something I want to show you. Something I think you will find very, very interesting. Now, I was going to have to bring it up at some point. Here is a good place to do it. While Gaster does type in all wingdings, it is also always all uppercase. Everything being in capitals like this somewhat ties it back, but that re-usage of very, very interesting, which existed all the way back in December 2015 with that old hidden file, him.png, this next experiment seems very, very interesting. So here now we have something coming up again nearly three years later, likely an experiment, oh, one that he finds very, very interesting. But it is not complete yet. No. It is far from complete. Thus, I have a small favor to ask of you. At that time, I will ask you a few questions. Then, using your responses, we will approach its realization. Thank you very much for your time. I will be in contact again soon. Return here in 24 hours. Here, Toby kind of breaks the illusion a little bit, just kind of briefly. For those who completed Undertale, it is really important that you check out the Twitter account 24 hours from now. I want to make something new, and it all begins with your feedback. He doesn't really reveal anything, but he does just kind of let people know that this is a real event huh. that's happening. It's not just him going nuts on Twitter or some sort of directionless tease. So the next day on October 31st, we get thank you for waiting so long. After all, you and I have both been waiting such a very long time. So to be here, finally, on the verge of connection, quickly kind of jumping forward a little bit, mentioning a chance to be connected. The whole survey program, Delta Rune, opens with Are We Connected? is quite exciting. I look forward to creating a new future with you. Holy cow. Now, show yourself. Delta Rune. Followed by links for us to go and check out the site. The game was not immediately revealed to be called Delta Rune. There was nothing telling people that this had anything to do with Undertale. Everything just kind of said, hey, you guys might find this worth checking out. When you even downloaded the game, the EXE file was just called Survey Program. 
Then again, using the Wayback Machine, we can see the website how it first was, before it had been turned into a Holy cow. page. Welcome, please read these final warnings, then take it in your hands. Gaster, and whoever was tweeting out through Undertale's account, has a weird, inexplicable way of putting unnecessary spaces between things to emphasize words. Very interesting and noteworthy that hand stands out as separate when Wingdings is all about talking in weird symbols and hands. And the next day, on November 1st, Toby comes back to thank us all for taking part in the project. He now says that he wants to build the larger game following Chapter 1 based on community feedback. So it may have literally been done as a survey to gauge initial responses and see how people physically played the game, what decisions huh. they made, how they interacted with things, how fast they played through it. But by releasing it this way, it shrouds it in this larger, dark mystery of some external influencer pulling the strings of this game world. It was a very fun, very cool way to set the tone for the game before it was even released. <laughs> now, the Twitter That's handle hilarious. for Undertale was changed into this The whole Chris thing was kind of hilarious, in my opinion. Six blank characters. Now, combined <sighs> with the tone, the delivery of the messages, the all capitals, the use of very, very interesting, people obviously were starting to think that this was Gaster speaking to us. It's missing that classic WD font, and this could be because Twitter doesn't really cooperate well with Wingdings, but if that was the issue, Toby could have easily typed it out somewhere else and pasted in pictures instead. Maybe in this one instance it was meant to be public and not cryptic, otherwise, it might not have generated the same generalized interest. Gaster is a pretty hidden part of the game, so people who didn't go out seeking that stuff aren't really aware of it. Using an illegible font like Wingdings might have deterred too many people from checking it out. So this could be seen from both Toby and Gaster's perspective, trying to make this survey as public and accessible as possible. Seeing as how massive the fan base of this game is, how secretive Toby can be, and how he was willing to sit on this game for years and years and years, it's likely that leaving out Wingdings here was very intentional. I said I would bring it up at some point, now- Well, that's an interesting beginning. So. Yeah, I'm going to cut this into two parts. The rest will be seen next week. So, I'm sorry if you thought I was going to do, like, the full video, but I'm going to make this into two parts. Uh, I honestly don't want to do this, but I'm going to have to for this time period. But in the end, I hope you all enjoy this video. In the comment section below, tell me what part of this surprised you. What awed you. What compelled, shocked, surprised, and yeah, all that kind of stuff. In my opinion, it has to be the fact that Toby had this whole Delta Room game idea the same time Undertale came out. Because to me that's incredible that he was able to have this idea years before it even came out and it came out so well. So yeah. Other than that, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Be sure to hit the like button down below. If you did, hit the subscribe button, support the channel, support the content provider, and so on and so forth. Hit the notification button to be notified immediately when a new video comes out. The link to this video will be down in the description below, so give two thumbs, two left thumbs, uh, some love and support for the video he created. So, other than that, I will see you all next time. Bye.